Welcome. Join us as we take a look ahead. We're doing a series on the Sabbath School lessons. This series is entitled The Gospel in Galatians. And this particular lesson is lesson number 11 entitled Freedom in Christ. It's a lesson for December 10 of 2011. And this lesson is all about the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. There's a lot of issues involved with that freedom. It does some strange things, I might add. We will attempt to describe what that freedom involves and how it contrasts with the slavery, two kinds of slavery, the slavery of legalism and the slavery of licentiousness. Now, maybe you hadn't thought of legalism and licentiousness as slavery, but we'll see how that works. So, let's start off. What is Christian freedom? What does freedom mean to you? And I guess the first question is, it, does it mean to be free from something, or does it mean free to, be, to able, be able to do something? Freedom to choose. Freedom to choose. <clears throat> freedom to do what you want. Freedom to do what you want. Both of those things are actions that you now can do that otherwise you couldn't do. So it's more of a freedom, you would say it's more freedom to be able to do something as opposed to a freedom from something. Now, if you've been in jail for four years, and you're let out, that would tend to be an idea that you're, freedom, you're free from something, right? Freed from something? Enslavement. Mm -hmm. From you prison. Bonded. Is there really a difference between the two? Well, that's what I'm asking. I'm, well, which uh, is more important? What Satan charges God with, with um, enslaving all his people. He needs to go with Satan, that's where you really get freedom from. Mm -hmm. So what about that freedom? Is there a difference there? Satan, you can do anything you want. That's right. That's freedom. That's, and, that's absolutely right. And the results of your freedom is what? Well, well don't that's, we often. that's the Lord doing that. We just need to get rid of the Lord, and <laughs> then we can um, have all the freedom we want. Well, we have people in the world who... Preach that message. Preach that message and have the wherewithal to accomplish that. On my, on my TV, they keep saying, what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. What does that mean? Slavery. Where, what does that have to do with freedom? Well, you're free to do whatever you want in Las Vegas and it stays there. And well, isn't that home. freedom? Well, that's the question. That's the question, yeah. That's freedom. Does it have any implications? I had, Does it have any consequences? When I was here a long time ago, I was learning to fly. And uh, there was a man who had a, a gas station. And he took the business of taking his, his, his employees up to Las Vegas so they could gamble and have fun. And uh, one time I had the chance to take them up there. Well, he, he kept on with that freedom, the freedom to go up and do as he exact well please. He lost his family, he lost his business, he lost, he made a ruin of everything. How was freedom? Well, he got his freedom. It was freedom. But it's a freedom that brought him slavery. Yeah, we can't trust ourselves to be free. Look what happened to Adam and Eve when they were free and they didn't right. obey the guidelines. So, so then we should have a fence around things so we won't. It's called the Ten Commandments. It's for our it's own good. That's a fence. That's a fence. Okay. That's what, that's what Paul says in Galatians 3. We already, we already studied that. You were supposed to know that answer already. <laughs> well, fence? <laughs> fence? Yes. True freedom is not to be enslaved by our evil tendencies. And then we have the true freedom of living without having horrible consequences. Right. Well, this, this is what Paul says about it. Galatians 5, starting with verse 1. Freedom is what we have. Christ has set us free. Stand then as free people and do not allow yourselves to become slaves again. Suggesting that we've already been slaves once, right? Slaves to what? Huh? Slaves in what context? Well, listen. I, Paul, tell you that if you allow yourselves to be circumcised, it means that Christ is of no use to you at all. Once more, I warn any man who allows himself to be circumcised that he is obliged to obey 
the whole law. And notice that law is capitalized there. Those of you who try to be put right with God by obeying the law have cut yourselves off from Christ. You are outside God's grace. As for us, our hope is that God will put us right with him. And this is what we wait for by the power of God's Spirit working through our faith. For when we are in union with Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor the lack of it makes any difference at all. What matters is faith that works through love. So he was saying slaves means they were being enslaved by trying to keep the law perfect and... Well, they weren't, they, they no longer had the ability to make their own choices. And they were suffering the consequences of being controlled by another, another, ag another agency, another force. And that was the law? Yeah, well, in the, in, in the evil consequences, it, that was a, they were really enslaved to a misunderstanding of law yeah. and what law was yeah. supposed to, mm -hmm. what they thought law was going to do for them. They were enslaved into the notion of keeping the law as a means of salvation. Yeah. So what's the other way of being put right with God? Well, I mean, besides the law. That's what, well, it's through Christ. Yeah. It's through Christ. Mm -hmm. so it sounds a little bit like um, I remember the Vietnam War when it used to, when it went on and on and on. Somebody came up and said, "Why don't we just just declare that we won and leave?" Mm -hmm. Okay, is that is that kind of like what they put in your putting yourself right with God? You just declare yourself um, righteous and leave. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't work quite like that. It doesn't work quite. No. Like that. So they were being enslaved to this false belief or this misunderstanding of how the function was of the law. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a good way to put it. They you, misunderstood the function of the yeah. law. You were doing so well, Paul says in verse 7. Who made you stop obeying the truth? How did he persuade you? It was not done by God who calls you. It takes only a little yeast to make the whole batch of dough rise, as they say. But I still feel confident about you. Our life and union with the Lord makes me confident that you will not take a different view and that the man who is upsetting you, whoever he is, will be punished by God. But as for me, my brothers and sisters, if I continue to preach that circumcision is necessary, why am I still being persecuted? Because we know from Paul's history, who was it that persecuted him? It was the Judaizers. It was the Jews. Jews. Yeah, they everywhere he went, he would speak to them in the synagogues. Some of them would accept the gospel and be, become Paul's followers, and the rest would end up persecuting him, throw him out, beat him, tried to stone him, etc. And mean Paul the, was a former Pharisee himself. Yes. You, you mean the mainstream Jews? Yes. Because he was a Jew. Yeah, I mean the mainstream Jews. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Paul says, if that were true, if I were still preaching circumcision, then my preaching about the cross of Christ would cause no trouble. I wish that the people who are upsetting you would go all the way, let them go on, and castrate themselves. That's pretty serious talk. What is Paul actually trying to say there? Well, Isn't he for all the good it does you, you might as well. Mm -hmm. He's saying you don't need to keep the law in order to be a Christian. But the law, no. 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 He's saying you don't need to keep the law as a means of salvation. You can't keep the law. You can't work and do enough good by keeping the law to be saved. But he never splits law from grace. No. And you are saved by grace, but like the woman taken in adultery, Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Then what did he do? Go sin no more. Well, what's, how do you know what sin is? The law is the only definition of sin. So the law sends, as you see your sin, sends you to, to Christ to be, take part of the grace and immediately Go and sin no more. So it's a it's back and forth, back and forth, and our life is in that is in now, that union. The lady he said, "Go and sin no more." To 
she ended up sinning six or seven more times, right? Where he had no, to. Well, that was historical, I think. I think that happened before this occasion. So now, are there some nuances in the text that are difficult to, for us to tell, you know, thousands of years later, reading it in English? Uh, when Paul is talking about the law, in some passages he's talking about the Ten Commandment law, and in other passages he's talking about all those laws that the Jews have piled up there. Um, of course, either way, it doesn't. Well, make any if difference. I kept if I kept all the Ten Commandments laws, I wouldn't. That wouldn't save me. No, because you can't. Well, yeah, and that's the thing. That's if right. you could, it would save you, but you can't. Save me from what? Well, what about presumably. Adam and what about Adam and Eve? Paul suggests in several places you could be saved by keeping the law. In fact, he says so right here in Galatians. If, so, you, if you could keep it. Okay, but Adam and Eve, uh, as long as they kept the law, they were saved. But if they broke the law, then they would be lost. So by keeping the law, they're saved. Mm -hmm. But I thought. Well, look, yeah, go ahead. Is there a, is there a difference? But I mean, I thought keeping the law wouldn't save you. Well, if you can, it, it will. It's just that you can't. It's just that you have nothing in you since Adam passed on what he had to you. What? You can't do it. What happened? So keep trying. What, ha what happened it won't there? Work. What happened well, that's there? That's a good question. That that's one of the big questions of Scripture. What really happened there? What what, the what happened? If it's keeping the law that saves us, what did Jesus' death on the cross do then? Well, I, I know that, but how come, it, how come I can't keep the law like Adam and Eve could? Well, that's a good question, but it, clearly you can't. Nobody else has six, <laughs> nobody except Does anybody Jesus. have the answer to that? Well, Jesus did it. Have people even tried to shut themselves up yes. in in monasteries or whatever where they do just one of the one of the classic examples of that was a gentleman called Saint Simeon and Saint Simeon lived just outside while well, he lived in the city of Antioch where Paul and Barnabas started their work and Paul and Silas did it was Paul's home church and outside of the city of Antioch Simeon decided that the way to keep himself separated from sin was to build a pillar and, and live on top of this pillar and at first it was like 10 feet tall. And people would come out and they would say, man, look at that saint. I mean, how could you sin sitting on top of 24 seven, sitting on top of a pillar? And eventually built the, built the pillar taller and taller. Finally, finally it was 60 feet tall. And there he is way up there. And other people came out and they built pillars around him. So this is, and so they, they developed a, a religious order called the, the stylites, the pillar sitters. To prevent themselves from sinning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. but. It's almost like if you do that, you you have a form of sin anyway, because um, you're kind of pulling yourself away from life. Mm -hmm. uh, for sure, you're not. You won't do what the um, parable of the talents said to do. I mean, they're acting like the guy that didn't do anything; that he just buried his 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 yeah. uh, talents and kept it there. Yeah. The same thing if you're sitting on a pillar, so... Okay, so I'd like to com comment though on, on, your, on your notion. It really wouldn't make any difference whether you were talking about the ceremonial law or the Ten Commandment law. If you try to keep that as a means of salvation, you are doomed to failure. Yeah. If you put yourself under the law to keep it, so that you can be saved by keeping it, it doesn't work. Never it's has, also, never will. But so if, if Jesus kept the law, then I ought to be able to keep the law. Is that correct? Theoretically. So is the law binding? <laughs> What's this theory stuff? Absolutely. But it's not, you don't the keep theory. it for that reason. When you go and experience grace, and you say, Lord, what would you have me to do? and you look over and you find that he has some recommendations in the Ten Commandment Law, you say, wonderful Lord, you help me. You help me do it. I can't do it on my own, but with your grace, put the power in me and I'll be happy to do it. And then what you do is done under his power, not under your strength, 
to gain salvation. So then I can keep all the Ten Commandments, but for a different reason. But but I'm doing it through His power. That's right. Yes. But there's another side. We don't want to leave this out. We don't want to get all just one side of the one ditch in this on this road. As for you, my brothers and sisters, you were called to be free. But do not let this freedom become an excuse for letting your physical desires control you. Now, what does that mean? Instead, let love make you serve one another. For the whole, notice, love make you serve one another. For the whole law is summed up in one commandment. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But if you act like wild animals, hurting and harming each other, then watch out or you will completely destroy one another. So the ditch on the other side of the road is, okay, I'm free, I can do whatever I like. Okay? What's wrong with that? Well, you, when you're in Christ, you don't want to do those things naturally. Well, that would be nice if it were just automatic, true, like that. But, in fact, the, every Christian has his temptations, right? Yeah. Yes, Jesus did. Mm -hmm. So it sounds to me like there is a balancing act between freedom and sacrifice. Okay, say more. Well, um, you got two ditches on either side of the road, yeah. right? Um, one is you're going to not let yourself become animals with all that great, mm -hmm. wonderful thing. So you're you're sacrificing in some way by mm -hmm. staying along middle of the road there but yet you still have the freedom when it's appropriate mm -hmm. you can't get out of this world without dying you either die in your sin or you die to self and either way it hurts mm -hmm. well there's a number of verses in the Bible that talk about these issues Hebrews 2 14 and 15 Romans 7 talks about Paul's personal struggle but we come to Romans 8, 1 in conclusion. Remember, there were no chapter and verse divisions in the original. There is no condemnation now for those who live in union with Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit, which brings less life in union with Christ Jesus, has set me free from the law of sin and death. Just like that. Well, well you know, union, it's kind of another word for connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's probably like connecting a battery to a light bulb, you know, we, um, we're connected. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's where the, um, the light comes from. <laughs> Union or harmony would be a synonym the, to be in harmony with the Creator. And I think it's actually a connection, some sort of connection. Well, I don't see how you can do it without being connected. Yeah. You have, you have, he talked about union a couple times. And well, a union, you buy it in the store, connects two pieces of pipe. It's yeah. called a union. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Connection. Well, it sounds like that when you're in connection and union with Christ, that you don't have to obey any law. I mean, well, here's, sometimes here's the when they say these sentences, I wish that they mm -hmm. would have made each one clear because mm -hmm. people can take that sentence and it can say, I'm, I'm yeah. free to do anything yeah, and, and I'm Christ. You know and connected, though. You can't. You're going you're gonna to know if they're connected by how they act, aren't you? Sure. Aren't well, you yeah, start yeah, but it can also mean in unity as well, not necessarily just connected. Well, well listen to this, because <clears throat> the, the plot thickens. This is not a freedom to do whatever our selfish souls choose. To love is to obey the law. And if we, in case you wonder where that is, look at Romans 13.8. Be under obligation to no one. The only obligation you have is to love one another. Whoever does this has obeyed the law. Okay? And so in Galatians 5.13, Paul concluded, As for you, my brothers and sisters, you were called to be free, but do not let this freedom become an excuse for letting your physical desires control you. Instead, let love make you serve one another. So it's, that's a repeat of what we saw there in Romans 13, isn't it? But to selfish human beings, does this sound like freedom at all? How can service to others be considered freedom? I mean, Paul, Paul talks about being set free from our own selfish desires, so now I can love other people and I can serve them. That sounds like slavery, doesn't it? 
when you don't have those desires anymore, it's no longer slavery because the desires are gone. Sometimes okay. people use a, like this Galatians uh, 5.14 as a means of putting aside part of the law. Mm -hmm. When it says the law is fulfilled in one word, love your neighbor as yourself, where's the part that says love God? Well, of course, Jesus talks about that back in the Gospels. And well, Paul's just repeating the second part of that. You're not going to love your neighbor if you don't love God, I don't well, think. Well, you love your neighbor because God loves them. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're talking about love, you're talking about value. That's basically it. If I value you, I'm going to take care of you. I've had people if I value anything, I'm going to use take care this to try to do away with the Sabbath. Yeah. Well, well you know, there, there's, a, there's a passage that says, if you have done it under the least of one of these, my brother, speaking about your friends, yeah. then you've done it unto me. So... It's, it's, well, it's like that little passage, just a little short. Because if, if you are treating your others as you would treat yourself, if you're loving others, then you're also loving God. Okay, it is only by doing away with our selfish human tendencies and adopting the Christian ideal of love for others that we can gradually become more like Jesus. Is that easy for selfish human beings to do? No, no I think it's very easy for us to love our friends. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't stop there. Matthew 5, 43, love your what? Enemies. Enemies. That's why we need Christ to help us because we can't do it by ourselves. Is it, okay. well, is it possible to love someone but have a hard time putting up with them? <laughs> <laughs> you love them but you don't like them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, by looking at the example of Jesus and by following as far as possible His example, we can eventually learn that serving others brings the greatest happiness. In fact, serving others is the right thing to do. Thus, it will be possible for God to turn loose a group of former sinners into the new earth with no jails, no police, and no restrictions because they are completely free. That is, they never want to do anything that is wrong, so they will only do what is right. So they can do whatever they want, right? Because they only do right things. I have told several people that story you tell about the long spoons in the room. Yes. Would this be an appropriate place to? Well, yeah, let me, let me tell that story very quick. There's, it it there's, illustrates it yeah. so well. There's a, a story, obviously a, a, a made up story, about a man who died and showed up at the pearly gates and asked St. Peter uh, if he could come in. And Well, Peter asked him, is there anything you'd like to do before you get in here? And the man says, well, you know, I've always really wondered what it was like at that other place. And Peter, Peter says, oh, okay, fine. I'll get one of the angels to take you down there and you can see what it's like in hell. So down they go and they're there and they walk into that place and the people just look like skin and bones and they can hardly move. They're just suffering. They just look awful. And this guy is looking around and he can hardly, and almost turns his stomach to look at these people. And then just as, there, as he's getting ready to go, he hears a bell ringing. And he says to his angel, he says, well, what was, what's the bell? And the, and the angel says, well, that's the dinner bell. And the guy says, the dinner bell? These people don't look like they've had anything to eat for years. Well, the angel says, come and you can see. And so they walked over there, and there was this long building, and there's a door, a few doors, and there's angels at the doors. And as you go into the doors, you put your arms out straight, and they put a thing around your elbow so you can't bend your elbow, and then you fork a knife and your spoon and your, spoon and your fork are out here like this. And the people are rushing in, and there's this gorgeous table set with every kind of food you can possibly imagine. And the people are just going like this, they can't get any food to their mouths because they can't bend their elbows. Finally, the bell rings and they march out. And nobody's had anything to eat. And then the angel takes the man back to heaven. And when they get to heaven inside the pearly gates, the angel is showing him around. And there's a bell ringing. And the guy says, what was that? And he says, a dinner bell. He says, oh, OK, let's go. And they get there. And here's the long building. And there's the doors. And the angels are putting things around each person's arm as they go in. And there's a fork and a knife. And they sit down at this long but narrow table with all this gorgeous food on it. And guess what happens? Each person picks up the food 
and feeds the person across the table from them. And that's the way these people look very healthy and fine. Well, you but know, in other pace, they can't even think about serving somebody else. All they can think about is feeding themselves. And on this earth, when you feed other people instead mm -hmm. of selfish, mm -hmm your uh, emotions are able to be fed. You're like a fatted calf. Uh, Emotion-wise, you're happy. Mm -hmm. And if you're constantly selfish, your emotions are like the skinny yeah. thing, so. Okay, now let's, let's talk about the way people have tried to explain this passage. Christians have often said that Jesus paid the price for our sins. There are some verses that talk about ransom and things like that. What is the price for our sins? The wages, wages of sin Five dollars per yeah. sin or something like that, what? Wages of sin but is Sin death. pays the wage. Mm -hmm. Sin pays its wage, the wage is death. Okay. God doesn't... Romans 6, 23. Okay. Yeah. Okay, who demands that the price be paid? Nobody. The wages of sin... That's just sin. the way it works. That's just the way it works? To whom is it paid? Nobody. Nobody. Nobody demands it. Nobody, you're not paid to anybody. It just happens. Well, works. some people say, well, it's the law. It's, uh, law demands it. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, their concept of law does, is in a different paradigm than mine would be. It's not God that demands it? No. Does it's it just God? the way things work. You live out of harmony, you're no well, longer connected. We were talking about connected earlier. It if, must be, though. If, if something needs to be paid, somebody's got to be demanding it. Who's demanding it? Well, and, and the final question, which is maybe the most important question of all, is how can we tell if it's really been paid? God says, if you sin, you will die. Is that a principle just like gravity or mm -hmm. other principles? So God was not saying, if you sin, I'm going to kill you. Mm -hmm. But if you sin, you will die. And if you drop a ball at, from the top of a building, it's going to go down. So God was just explaining how things work in heaven? If you sin, you die? Well, then you don't die in heaven. He was explaining maybe from heaven. <laughs> he, he says, if you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you're going to die. No explanation of the physics involved, or, or it didn't say well, it's a threat or a warning. He just made a statement. That's all we have a record of anyway. Well, but we have discussed uh, in sessions past <clears throat> that um, had had um, the people on the earth uh, uh, been permitted to maintain access to the tree of life, then they could have lived forever. Lived forever, and I'm not sure I that that makes any sense to me. That seems to be contradictory to what you have just said. My my perception is that when you sin, you're separating yourself. You are choosing actually to separate exactly. yourself. From and that's, from that's what from God, and yet when we talked about, well, when we're not, we're not we haven't, haven't separated yourself far enough because we're going to cut you off from the tree of that's life. That's so. what that's what the angel that's what the the angel said together, that that if we don't take away this tree, they'll live forever. In other words, they had to um, they had to perform the symbol to make sure that the tree gets taken away from them to Separation. show to show the separation mm -hmm. as it happens with Christ. When you, when you separate from Christ, you separate from God. The, the wages, I mean, separation just causes death. Yeah, That's right. Isaiah 59 too. In this lesson, there's considerable effort to spell out the difference between doing the law as some kind of a means to earn our own salvation as opposed to fulfilling the law, meaning to ha that having received salvation by faith, we learn to serve others, thus obeying the law. Is that sufficiently confusing? Paul suggested that salvation sets us free from bondage to sin, death, and the devil. How does that actually work? What is the relationship between the joy of salvation and faith? So now we're going to try to put all these things together. If you told a thoroughly selfish person of the world that you were going to set him free to serve others, would he be attracted by that idea? No. Well, unless he could use them. <laughs> Maybe. But he has to serve them. They're not supposed to serve him. Well, you, you, you work it out. Work it out, okay. <laughs> they would, 
in general, selfish people wouldn't be interested in that idea at all. No. So how do Christians get weaned away from selfishness and learn to be truly loving? Isn't that the crux, the crux of the matter here? Is it really possible for a former sinner, a selfish descendant of Adam and Eve, to learn to love others as we love ourselves? How do we do that? By asking Jesus to dwell in us daily and dying to self daily. By beholding, we, we become, become changed. changed. By beholding, we become changed. Second Corinthians 3.18. And it doesn't make any difference. Great controversy. What it is you spend your time beholding, you will be changed, whether you look at Christ or whether you look at something else. You, you, you don't, will be you changed. Don't, you don't mean that if I spend my time going to the movies, I'm going to be changed. I do. You do. Mm -hmm. mm. Also, exactly what I, mean. I think it's very important to surround yourself with people who have learned to be unselfish so that you see the modeling. Where do you, you find those kind of people? Well, you're supposed to find them in church, okay. but you can find them. Um, they, they exist all sorts of places. Mm -hmm. There's probably a higher percentage of them in church, but certainly not 100% of them. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> well, how did Christ set us free? Did he do that by somehow paying our debts? Or did he do it by demonstrating the truth about God and what it means to live a sinless life and what the choices are between life and death? That's it. Well, if you read 1 Corinthians 6, 20, let's just pick that one out, for example. He bought you for a price, so use your bodies for God's glory. Okay? Let's try another one. What about 10, 13, and 14? Every test that you've experienced is the kind that normally comes to people. But God keeps His promise, and He will not allow you to be tested beyond your power to remain firm. At the time you are put to the test, He will give you the strength to endure it, and so provide you with a way out. Now, is that, is that clear instructions? So then, my dear friends, keep away from the worship of idols. Okay? And let me try Colossians 2.6. Since you have accepted Christ Jesus as Lord, live in union with Him. How do you do that? Well, Paul made it very clear that giving, given certain facts, which he stated, we are then responsible to do certain things. God gives us strength, He gives us life, but not so we can waste it. We are set free to use our bodies to bring glory to God. Obviously, freedom was a major issue for Paul. Why do you think that was? He speaks about freedom 28 times in his letters, and the rest of the New Testament only mentions it 13 times. Well, because people were, had enslaved themselves trying to keep all these rules. Yeah. Well, you know, Paul was a Pharisee himself that yes. followed so many rules every day of his life, and so he probably felt uh, freedom. He knew um, that that wasn't necessary, what he was doing in the past. And the Jews had been in circumstances where they weren't free. They had been slaves centuries before, mm -hmm. and certainly that was a big part of their cultural history. Mm -hmm. But they were under the Roman thumb right now that that Paul is talking about. They had is, free people, enslaved people, and the Jews felt that they were enslaved by the Romans here. In oh, well, the Pharisees and the Sadducees <coughs> said, to, said to Jesus, we have never been slaves to anybody. Well, they were wrong Romans, about a lot John of things. John 8, it says right there. <laughs> <laughs> they were wrong about a lot of things. <laughs> well, Jesus himself stated that uh, well, one more thing. Is he talking about like economic and political freedom or some other kind of freedom? Some other kind. What kind? Is it freedom, freedom from freedom the tyranny of sin? <clears throat> yes. Well, Jesus himself stated that as human beings, we will serve one of two possible masters. You know those verses? Matthew six twenty four. look at that. No one can be a slave of two masters. He will hate one and love the other. He will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Okay, and Luke 16, 13 says essentially the same thing. Does that mean, now here's the question, does that mean that no matter what we do, we will always be slaves to one master or the other? Well, we are slaves to a lot of things. We're slaves to food. 
We've got to have food. Mm -hmm. but, but it says two masters. So it says you, can't, even, you can't serve two. Yeah. You either so, serve God or money. Does that mean that there's no other options? You're either going to serve this one or you're going to serve that one? Yeah. That's what it's saying. Uh, and is serving God there's a difference. Is serving God considered to be a slave? Well, to whom are we slaves? Do we have to serve one or the other master? The answer is yes, apparently, according to Scripture. Yeah. And basically, what are we talking about? We're basically talking about our motives. Our motives will either be selfish or they will be loving. What motivates us? We'll be slaves to righteousness. Okay, well, that's, that's loving. Depends on the circumstance. Yeah, I was going to say we're dynamic people. We can be loving in this situation, this and this, selfish in this and this and this, and in between and this. Yeah, because the scriptures say you can't be lukewarm. You have to be either hot or cold. Mm -hmm. When people are kind to me, it's easier to be kind back. When they're not so kind, yeah. why? Well, the early, the early Christian <coughs> preacher in New England by the name of Jonathan Edwards, who we probably all heard about, said this about an angry God. He said, So that thus it is that natural men are held in the hand of God over the pit of hell. Mm -hmm. They have deserved the fiery pit and are already sentenced to it. And God is dreadfully provoked. His anger is as great towards them as to those that are actually suffering the executions of the fierceness of His wrath in hell. And they have done nothing in the least to appease or abate that anger. Neither is God in the least bound by any promise to hold them up one minute, one moment. The devil is waiting for them. Hell is gaping for them. The flames gather and flash about them and would fain lay hold on them and swallow them up. The fire pent up in their own hearts is struggling to break out. They have no interest in any mediator. They are, there are no means within reach that can be any security for them, to them. In short, they have no refuge, nothing to take hold of. All that preserves them, from, preserves them every moment is the mere arbitrary will and uncovenanted, unobliged forbearance of an incensed God. Wow. How does that sound? Yeah. Not a very good like picture it. of God. You don't <laughs> like it? What? Yeah, Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Wow. So he pictures you dangling over the fire pits of hell, and God can let go at any time. And you've really offended him. He's angry, and he has no reason to hold on to you anymore. So any time he can just arbitrarily let you go. And he was a popular preacher. Yeah, famous. That's not what Scripture says about God. It isn't? His character. No. If you felt that it was your job to appease the anger or wrath of such a God, how would you do it? Not willingly. <laughs> Not willingly. <laughs> well, it, that, that very concept has led people to sacrifice their children on the arms of an angry Moloch. Yeah. And on the flip side, uh, sullen submission produces the character of a rebel. So you have those two extremes. Yeah. Are we among the millions who have recognized the freeing actions of Jesus Christ? Can we see the changes that have resulted from our relationship with Jesus Christ? Our lives should be continually growing more like Jesus. Remember that if you're still worshiping exactly the same God that you worshiped one year ago, you are worshiping a graven image. An idol. An idol. In our spiritual walk, are we allowed to go two steps forward and one step back? Two steps forward and one you mean, step back? You mean, is that what we do? Is that yeah. what we do? <laughs> That's what we do. Well, at least you're progressing, <laughs> in the right, hopefully in the right direction. Yeah. Well, freedom must be measured by outcomes, right? So how do you exercise your freedom? What does it mean to you? Are you sure that you are free from the bondage of legalism as well as the bondage of licentiousness? What is licentiousness? Well, licentiousness means you do whatever your selfish nature sort of feels like doing. Okay. 
So what are the dangers of legalism? It gets depressing because you can't keep up you can't keep up with the program. There's so many rules that you just can't keep up with it, them. It's fatal. Yeah. It, the sequence that usually happens to church members is like this. They're baptized and when they come into the church they're all excited and they're, oh man, we're going to do all this and w you know, it, we're, it, we're going to be saved by, by becoming church members and so forth. And they come in and they pretty soon they realize when they're finally re you know, serious enough that they can't do it. They haven't succeeded. And so the natural tendency is they start looking around, seeing how well the other people are doing. And they discover what? Other the other people. doing it either. The other people are not doing it either. So then there's a tendency to say, one of two things. There's a tendency either to say, well, forget the whole thing. It, it's a waste of time and drop out. Or to say, well, maybe God grades on the curve. Well, I'm as good as that one is. Yeah. So I must be okay too. Yeah, exactly. Is that, is that the way things should go? Or you go looking for somebody else that has some words that tickle your ears. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I've seen people, you know, instead of finding out that they can't do it very quickly, they kind of hold on. Uh -huh. And they kind of, like the rubber band is starting to pull them, pull them and pull them, you know, and, it, and life gets pretty tough for them. Yep. And then what happens when life gets tough for them they're going to make sure it gets tough for you too, <laughs> mm -hmm. because if you you look like you're freer than than they are, well then you're gonna you're gonna want to um, ridicule them, tell them that you're not doing it right, because you're having an easier time than I am. <laughs> if you are trying to please God by things you do, you no longer are accepting the righteousness by faith that God has offered you free of charge. If you think, okay, I'm going to do this and this and this and this and this, even when you start down that road, you're saying, thank you, Jesus, but I don't need you. I can earn my salvation myself. Well, you know, anybody that does that has not really received the gospel. Okay. They haven't. Because isn't that good news? Mm -hmm. It's better news than, than the old stuff, you know, where you had to do everything by yourself. Well, if you accept, but there's a difference. See, if I'm doing it all by myself, then I can be proud of what I've accomplished. Well, then you find out that you will never be proud of what you accomplish. Now, and that's there, not good news. Isn't there something where you love God and you want to participate in His ways and His kingdom, and so you're doing these things? Maybe you're not succeeding, having some successes, but it looks on the external exactly like you said you're trying to do something on your own but really you're trying to um, respond to God's love by maybe holding an evangelistic meeting or doing something like that so how do you tell the difference you the don't it's very you difficult you don't from because the outside. that that would equate to judging and that's not your business so is it God who can see the difference on Absolutely. why you're doing That's something? Right. That's it. What he's looking at is the motives. But also inside of you, are we so deceived that we, can, we don't know our motives? Sometimes. Or can we tell when we're doing something for God and Sometimes. when we're doing something for ourselves? Yes. Are, our, are our works a litmus of what we are? Is that a no, litmus of our I would say our, our, motives, our motives are a better litmus. Yeah, but it's by our works. We're judged, it says. Yeah, but who does the judging? Ah, that's the question. And does he understand the motives? But there's some, there's some understanding by other people who, that are watching the judgment that uh, he judges correctly. Mm -hmm. So there is some... How do they decide that God judges correctly? By looking at their works. <laughs> they, They've made by looking by at looking at him and looking, looking at, at the, the results, looking at the results. You know, I had some students in class, and they would be sometimes real mess ups, or they they were just plain couldn't not intellectually smart, but their heart was right, and I really enjoyed those students than the students who maybe were doing better, and I felt manipulated. 
So God probably, even though we're not doing things right, if our heart is right, he probably says, ah, oh, you know, I really like you, my child. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But well, you could tell by what they do whether their heart was right or not. By I mean, the way there they had act to be some indicator. There has to be some indicator. Yeah. So I don't think you can judge a person without looking inside their heart and seeing the motives. The outward acts. Not accurate. Th that's yeah. right. The outward acts are insufficient. Mm -hmm. So no one can tell but God. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. Well, citizenship always involves responsibilities. Just ask the people who live in the United States when it comes April 15. <laughs> what are the responsibilities of a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? Do we have to give up our legalistic, fear-driven religion? Yes. Yes. If you're trying to earn your salvation by a lot of things that you do to prove to God that you're savable, what does that imply about God? Is he a hard taskmaster requiring a long list of do's and don'ts? Well, on the other hand, if you see the life and death of Jesus and recognize what God has done for you and freely admit that you could not do it for yourself and then accept the freely offered righteousness, it will be a transforming experience for your life. Love will become the predominant motivator instead of selfishness. This, of course, seems completely impossible to inherently selfish beings, but it is possible. Is this a miracle that God does today, mm -hmm. that when we ask God to help us be the kind of person that would fit into heaven and to be unselfish, that miraculously something helps us be that way? And we could say God is still in the business of miracles because mm -hmm. we see ourself, we become a miracle. Mm -hmm. Yes. How unselfish do I have to be? Oh boy. <laughs> oh, and now you're talking works again. If you it looks like you're, you're <laughs> winding yourself up to be unselfish. You have to be unselfish. You got the measuring stick out. Yeah. <laughs> well. What's the minimum requirement for heaven? That's you, you, you're once again asking the wrong. question, yeah. the wrong question. <laughs> the question is, are your actions motivated by love or are those actions motivated by selfishness? That's the question. And that's binary. Well, how much love is then okay? How, much, how loving do I have to be? How much love do I have to... Don't be fooled. The freedom <laughs> that we have in Christ is not permission for self-indulgence. Remember Romans, Galatians 5? We read this last week, but look at it. The Spirit produces, is there anything about selfishness here? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. There is no law against such things as these. Now, if you want to know what happens if you're not on God's side, Look back at verse 19. What human nature does is quite plain. It shows itself in immorality, filthy and indecent actions, in worship of idols and witchcraft. People become enemies and they fight. They become jealous, angry, and ambitious. They separate into parties and groups. They are envious, get drunk, have orgies, and do other things like these. It's quite a list. Paul, when he gets started talking about sins, he seems like he... He, ne he it gets to the bottom. He, he never, he, there's no end to it. So the fruit of the Spirit, remember, includes self-control. It not only includes self-control, but also death to self. This is not easy for selfish human beings. But here's the question. Let's be really honest about this. Wouldn't you love to live in a community where everyone loved everyone else, everyone was looking out for everyone else, where they are always helpful, always kind, always courteous, and always happy? I mean, who wouldn't want to live in a place like that, right? Well, I don't know. It might drive me crazy. <laughs> oh, no. Well, then maybe don't you don't know. belong there. I don't there. know what you're saying. I, I mean, I, I can't really picture that. And surrounding yourself with that kind of environment would just automatically make you better, mm -hmm. too, yourself. You know, we keep using this word selfish mm -hmm. and love. Mm -hmm. We, we've said it so many times this episode that, that <laughs> you know, it's starting to get me... 
<laughs> I just because I don't see those time? words. I don't see those words in here very much. I yeah. never see selfish in here. They, well, they're always using a different word, and then we come up with selfish. Yeah. It, doesn't Jesus say, "Love your neighbor as yourself"? Yes. So there is some self in it. <laughs> No, there is. There is. You're supposed to love I mean, yourself a lot. An iteration, if I ever heard one. What? What? <laughs> what? Well, here's the question. The point is, <laughs> no, I'm trying to get the meaning here. Yeah. Because well, when you start it. talking about self, when you say love, <laughs> well, then what do you mean by love? <laughs> I mean, to me, basic love is just to value a different person. Like I value you, I value you. Yeah. Just as much as okay, I do myself. Let me, let me read the statement once again and then go on to what comes next. Wouldn't you like to live in a community where you don't, obviously, you don't have to lock your doors, you don't have to worry about anybody stealing anything. Everyone loves everyone else. They wouldn't think of doing anything wrong to anyone else. They were always looking out for each other. They're always helpful, always kind, always courteous, always happy. Of course, and here's the crux, if you would like to belong to a community like that, you must be that kind of a person yourself. That's true, that's true. But the way you described it there, um, it's like almost like, well, it's not, it's not that, it's just, are they I like people who like themselves too. Not that they just like well, me and I but, treat myself like dirt you know, and I let everybody if, walk all over me. If you were part of that kind of a community, how could you not like yourself? Well, it doesn't come out unless you unless it's brought out like I just did. Because you, the way you said it was just like, okay, I'm going to be a mat in heaven and no. let everybody walk all over me. No, 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 it's no. It's no, your no. term of selfishness that that I'm worried about. Yeah. <laughs> what? Your term of it's, selfishness. It's, it's like those, the story we well, told what about. Did, what did Jesus mean when he said, love your neighbor like yourself? Mm -hmm. Because, because yes, there's what self, is selfishness. There is self mean. there. Yes. There is self there. But, but yeah, we're, 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 talking like, we're talking like self goes clear out the window. Let I, me ask you a question. I, I'm not sure Have I'd like. Have you had any trouble loving yourself? Yes, sometimes. <laughs> okay. Now. I have. I, when I screwed up on a test. Uh -huh. When when I when I forgot to like do something, yourself, you still when I didn't buy my wife some flowers, yeah. I didn't like myself after I did that. Okay. So so there is times when I don't like myself. Well, here's but, a question: yeah. Did Jesus like himself when he said, "Love others yes. as you"? Okay, but we don't have any scripture on what Jesus thought of himself. The Father says, "This is my Son, of who I'm well pleased." But Jesus had to have some self-esteem, self-worth, and knew what he was doing is right. John to have, 17. To have the uh, wherewithal to do what he did. So what he says is right. You have to have something in yourself before you can give to other people. Yeah. This requires the practice of true agape love. Then that's what the New Testament talks about. While we're here on this earth, we need to learn to practice this. It's completely unnatural for selfish human beings. Gary's just proved that to us. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is a kind of love which is based on principle and not emotion. It requires doing things for others long enough until we recognize that it is the greatest way to freedom and happiness. When we realize that and begin to act out that kind of behavior consistently with the help of the Holy Spirit, then we are on, tr on track to become like Jesus. Now, would marriages be better if people loved on principle as well as emotion? Yes. And not just emotion? Yes. But we can't That's be on track to be like Jesus without Jesus. We no. can't do that on our own. We need that connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we've been talking about some grand ideas of freedom and slavery and love and selfishness, great big concepts that we struggle with. But what, about, what happens when you boil that down to talk about the minutia, the daily, individual, tiny acts of life? The ancient Jews believed that they needed to please God. And they recognized that in Jewish history, when their nation stopped pleasing God, they got, they got into all kinds of trouble. So they decided to create for themselves a lot of rules to make sure that they were pleasing God. And what happened? Well, it's fine to make a lot of rules if you've thought them through carefully and so forth. 
if you want to apply them to yourself only. Say, I want to do better and I'm going to do this and this and this, so I'll be better. That's okay. But they didn't stop there. What do they want to do? They wanted to apply their little rules to everybody else, and I want to see whether Norm is doing the rules, and I want to know if Jay is doing the rules, and I want to know if Gary is doing the rules, and even Cherie. Is she following my rules? They, call, they produced multiplied rules, which they then wanted to apply to everyone. There were rules for dress. There were rules for diet. There were rules for leisure. There every aspect of living. There were, there were hundreds of rules for how you kept the Sabbath. The rules became a burden that would, it was impossible to bear. So, we asked to come back to our question, how do you fulfill the whole law? Well, look at those verses, Galatians 3, 13 to 15, very quickly. As for you, my brothers and sisters, you were called to be free. But do not let this freedom become an excuse for letting your physical desires control you. Instead, let love make you serve one another. For the whole law is summed up in, our, in one commandment, love your neighbor as you love yourself. But if you act like wild animals, hurting and harming each other, then watch out or you will, be, you will completely destroy one another. If we could keep all the laws that God has given us, we could live by doing so, but we cannot. However, if we learn to truly love, Paul says repeatedly that love is the fulfilling of all law. Many ancient rulers made rules for their people. Many of those law codes include expressions that represent what every mother has said at one time or another to her children, I'm sure. If you don't want your sibling to do that to you, do not do it to him or her. Have you ever heard such a thing from your mother? Mm -hmm. You don't want Johnny to hit you, don't hit Johnny, right? Mm -hmm. But Jesus took that ancient adage and turned it into something completely different and incredibly more powerful. He said, do for others what you want them to do for you. This is the meaning of the Law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. If we compare Christ's statement here, if we recognize what he's asking us to do, we'll begin to get a picture of what it's like to be truly loving, to be the kind of people that would be safe to have in that heavenly kingdom. And I hope every one of us, including all of you who are listening, will one day have an experience like that for ourselves. See you next week.